everyone, it's Alex, and as you can see, I'm staying at a friend's apartment uh, while I'm home for the holidays, so apologies in advance, too, for the volume. I forgot to pack my mic, too, so uh, the volume may not be great, mainly because I want everyone to, you know, listen in, because, you know, this is the time of year. Everyone does their top reads of the year, and this is mine for the best 10 books I read for 2021. For a bit of scope, um, I read 60 books this year, and so with this top 10, uh, I would say there's a lot more rearranging than I thought there'd be. So kicking right off with number 10, I have Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. This follows a woman named Martha as she recounts her life, all based on how she believed when she was 17. She describes it as a bomb going off in her head. Ever since then, Martha sort of navigates mental health and her relationships with a bit of suspicion. But the reason that this is on my list is because Meg Mason, <laughs> Olive, knows how to write with such compelling voice that I found Martha so readable to read about. I really reveled in Martha interacting with her peers especially, who equally take such great time with the spotlight when given it. And I would classify this book as a romance novel, which I had no idea going into whenever reading it. But in that way, I do think it's clever, mainly because I feel like Meg Mason were to write a romance novel that actively sucks the life out of romance. So this is definitely a book where I just loved the execution of it, so I would also really categorize this as the kids call it for anyone looking for a book while being in their flea bag era. At number 9, I have Catch the Rabbit by Lana Bastashis, translated from the Serbo Croatian by the author herself. This novel is essentially a road trip novel about a woman named Sara as her friend Layla gets in contact with her after many years, where Layla requests that Sara help her find her missing brother. Although things bubble up over time as Sara and Layla are rekindling their friendship, and weaved in between Sara's impressions about reflecting on this road trip that happened are also segments dedicated to memories of Sara and Layla beginning their friendship in the past. So while I think the premise of the story with how linear it seems with the presentation, I think the real greatness of it, or the greatest achievement, is those segments dedicated to those memories of Sara and Layla's friendship. And because of the premise, I think it really helped blanket kind of where the story goes. It's kind of turning into a ticking time bomb with this road trip in which Sara really has to discover and define why she's even friends with Layla in the first place. With Beth, she's also talking about things like idolization and projection in such a controlled and thoughtful and lucid way that I really love. All written in such hypnotizing prose and at times really beautifully explained and I just really loved it. At number eight, I have The Lost Daughter by Elena Ferrante, translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein. It wouldn't quite be a top reads of the year video unless I put Ferrante in it. The Lost Daughter follows a woman named Leda as we find her as she's sort of essentially taking a vacation for herself. But we realize that Leda is a mother, so we get to know how the role of motherhood really shaped how Leda defines her life. If you've read Ferrante before, you would know that motherhood isn't too out of the ordinary as a theme. But what surprises me about The Lost Daughter, whenever thinking of now having read all of Ferrante's works, is how I think Leda is maybe the most approachable and digestible in Ferrante's heroines of really trying to tackle frequent moral dilemmas. As this becomes more clear as Leda, while she's on vacation, observes this family that's also there, that Leda takes it upon herself to think back on the past and looking at this family she's observing, she thinks of herself as she was a young mother as well. There's something really haunting about Fronte's work that really stays with me for a long time, and The Lost Daughter was exactly in that same camp. And I would say, I think definitively I would think that The Lost Daughter is my suggestion at anyone who's never read Fronte before. I think The Lost Daughter, not only with its themes, but just where it's a bit shorter as a novella, is a great starting point for anyone considering reading Fronte for the first time. So I highly recommend this book. And no one told me that the adaptation of The Lost Daughter comes out tomorrow. Uh, I knew it was like happening and stuff, but I didn't know it was tomorrow. So this will definitely be my Joker, as the kids also say. Coming in at number seven, I have a very recent read and that's actually Love in the Big City by Sang Young Park. This coming-of-age novel follows a man named Young as he's living 
his wife being openly gay in Korea. And I think if I'm remembering this correctly, that the story itself spans from the early 2000s up into present day. For the cultural context of somewhere like Korea, based on my own Western perspective, considering the perspective, too, of the evolution of LGBTQ progressiveness. But what I love about this book is how Park manages to display intimacy as something very private but also confined within its own boundaries of very private spaces, with a literal description of a bedroom at one point being described as a coffin, but acknowledging at the same time how bedrooms or that sense of privacy is also perhaps where LGBTQ people can feel most liberated or maybe themselves. And Park also flips this into considerations in spaces and communities in Korea where people like Young can feel like most himself. But again, our ambassador throughout all of these ideas within the context of Korea is Young, as we follow him into early adulthood and then also late adulthood. And Young is truly the star of this book, I would say, really having like complete absence of humility. Well, Park also makes sure to give Young his own insecurities and vulnerabilities that we explore through his friendships and also romantic relationships. And I would say initially that the character of Young is probably within the same realm of your Otessa Moshfag characters or Sally Rooney characters or etc. But Young sets himself apart with this millennial malaise, I think, through this consistent confidence in trial and error, which is super refreshing to me. Making love in the big city, I think, sort of in a meta way, culturally aware of the contemporary literary fiction that I think readers are wanting that familiarity with. But Park manages to still make sure that Young is going to be one of the most memorable characters I've read in a really long time, and I just really love this book, so I hope more people pick it up. At number six, we finally break into nonfiction, and that is with Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. This chronicles a time where Zahner explains that her mother is in poor health, while Zahner herself is in her mid-twenties. And as some readers might know while going into this book, Michelle Zahner is actually the lead singer of indie band Japanese Breakfast. So when I first picked up this memoir, knowing who Zahner was, I had the classification, which I would still think is true, of Crying in H Mart being labeled as celebrity memoir, which isn't even anything negative. But going in, my expectations were low, just with my patterns of experience reading celebrity memoir in the past and not really having a great time. But Crying in H Mart is really a wonderfully compassionate and tender memoir that I really loved. Whether talking about what it feels like maybe growing up as Korean American, or it's a very uh, sort of surprising parts of being both very confessional and vulnerable that might hit the beats of what people expect when reading a memoir. Even when these things happen, it comes off as being very graceful and told so generously. Where at times it feels like Zahner actually feels like she inserts herself more like a character in a novel. Building up how I think Zahner had to feel like maybe she was having to become more mature with these stacked experiences as her mother's health debilitates, feeling that crushing weight of someone that's realizing trying to anticipate losing a loved one. And of course this memoir isn't spared of maybe some cracks with maybe some overly symbolic gestures sometimes, but I really didn't mind those parts at all because I felt like everything Zahner was writing was from such a genuine place that I just really loved this memoir. So I feel like it is like the IT memoir of 2021 but I think rightfully so. Coming in at number five, we actually have another nonfiction, and it's Just Us by Claudia Rankine. This follows a series of essays by Rankine, also with compiled mixed media, where Rankine articulates her confrontations with topics like race and gender within the context of living in the United States. But while reading these essays, Rankine's surprise isn't really from the topics themselves, but rather how in like a couple of these essays, it's more so about her experiences with her labeled progressive peers. And ultimately, I think how Rankine is articulating how progressiveness at times from how people would describe it often feels a convenience or inconvenience. So to me, this book felt like kind of an idea of asking oneself, what happens after we acknowledge our own progressiveness towards topics like race and gender? Maybe getting more into the nitty gritty of the more in-depth topics and accountability of things like performative activism or neoliberalism. And thinking of that accountability again, I really love how Rankine writes these essays with the thought in mind of really leaving that accountability with the reader while still having such commanding confidence in the way these essays are written while also still having this 
very controlled and patient prose. But yeah, I really love this. And I remember I got my copy from the library, but immediately when I returned it, I went to go out to buy my own copy. So I really hope people pick this up. I think it's really wonderful and I hope more people read it. Getting down to the wire here, and at number four we have the Copenhagen Trilogy by Tovgut Levson, translated from the Danish by Tina Nunali and Michael Favala Goldman. This trilogy is actually a series of memoirs that are collected since they spanned release, I think, somewhere between the 1960s and 1970s. But the trilogy itself as a one package deal just came out this year as a new release. Split between childhood, youth, and dependency, where you might expect the childhood one is did lesson through her early years. Youth is about her teen years, and then dependency is about her adulthood. And the backdrop of time and place of Denmark is also in consideration of thinking about things about did lesson uh, calling upon how Hitler's rise to power is happening. But on the other hand, we have did lesson's wonderful wit and very plainly written prose that I think is a good thing. And I think that plain prose I mentioned, again, being a good thing, is because I think getting to know Dit Lepson through these memoirs is that she's someone that was clearly very calculated, but in a way in which she just, you could tell she cared so much about wanting to be a writer, in which she kind of did everything she could to really have those types of resources. As clear as early whenever having written childhood, whenever she reflects on being younger, kind of describing her family in a way that feels like they are their own cast of characters in a well-structured novel. But throughout the Copenhagen trilogy, Dit Lepsen clearly has this attachment to realism and really defining expectations of how she was someone that openly wanted this creative pursuit, but realizing that the resources weren't entirely there. Being a woman, no less, and really trying to think about the constant struggle of uh, financial resources. Again, this is paired really wonderfully with the very dry and witty prose, I think, that really leans itself to having an opening for these really comedic moments. I specifically remember one part where a boy goes up to compliment Dit Lepsen, and immediately she wastes no time in wondering if he's single and if she can marry him. Kind of again, sort of emphasizing that ability of resources that you know, maybe having a dual income could really help be a writer too. Which Dit Lepsen goes on to explain with her career in dependency, for example, in which she also has other struggles that surface and things like that. So I just really love this whole trilogy and I just really love Dit Lepsen's voice. In 2022, I really hope to pick up some of her novels because I know she has a large body of work between different disciplines too. So I'm really excited to read more Dit Lepsen in the future. And taking the bronze for my third favorite book of 2021 is Fake Accounts by Lauren Euler. I read this all the way back in January and really haven't stopped thinking about it since. I think the easiest way to describe Fake Accounts as like a premise is that it's about this woman who finds out that her boyfriend is secretly a popular online conspiracy theorist. From there, it really is essentially like a giant rabbit hole where our narrator gets invested in sort of what happens whenever we just begin innocently, perhaps online, that sort of creates these layers of artificiality. And then piggybacks from that on maybe what it means to be our most authentic presentation of ourselves, not only then online, but also offline. I think with a book managing to make me think about so much is in a way how it not only stays with me but also why I love what books do for me and what reading does and which how it makes me think so much about the external of the ideas that are presented. And I mean honestly it's not that deep like with the idea of like online presences or whatever that fake accounts made me think of. But I think in my entirety, especially when I think maybe back to my January wrap up of when I talked about this book, I just remember taking notes for that like putting all my ideas down to paper that I just was, like, I just really loved reading this book and the ideas it made me, basically the conversation it made me had with myself. And how this mirror of, when I was reading fake accounts, I had this sense of immediacy, maybe gave me this impression of a similar familiarity of maybe perhaps the immediacy of doom scrolling through a Twitter or something or being in an online space. Turning real life into these experiences that come off as research, which is very much what our narrator does in fake accounts too. But what I especially love is that Euler never takes that stance of trying to moralize anything about being online. In a way, kind of that making everything a bit more like 
uh, being online is like a hellscape, or at least kind of haunting and like all the more poignant for me. But yeah, I really love this book, and it was really addicting to read. And I don't know if that technically like makes me part of the problem with absorbing like a piece of media within the same realm of like conflicting with the narrator with thinking and stuff. But yeah, read it for yourself, and then you can let me know, but I just really loved reading fake accounts. Our runner-up for my second favorite book of the year is A True Novel by Manai Mizumura, translated from the Japanese by Juliet Winters Carpenter. The pitch of this book at a basic level is that it is a Japanese retelling of Weathering Heights by Emily Bronte. But the book is really so much more than that in which how Mizumura sets the backdrop of this story within Japan itself. In my opinion, elevating even more of the stakes and tension between the reimagination of Heathcliff and Catherine within these updated characteristics of a more modern day world that is maybe leaning more towards being more empathetic, or at least, if anything, more morally conscious than Bronte's very enthusiastic characters, I will say. Thinking more of this more updated world of Japan that Mizumura sets us in, with this retelling. I think it also does sort of give more of the accountability of other themes like privilege and poverty that I think stick a lot more for me than how I thought of those themes while reading Wuthering Heights. But what really landed for me with this book is the concept of what I was discovering about, on one hand, why the book is called a true novel, largely in part due to Japanese literature history being that there exists something called an I novel, which we closely might relate to maybe being a work of something like autofiction. So in itself, how a true novel as a book actually has a prologue dedicated to a fictionalized version of Manai Mizumura writing this Japanese retelling of Wuthering Heights and how there are these distinctions between an I novel but also a true novel and how that all is within the context of Japanese literature. I promise all of that <laughs> is fun, or at least fun to me, and even without that context stuff, I really do think a true novel, when thinking of my reading year, is one of the most uh, greatly readable books that I read. And at times, sure, it is indulgent, because it is a very long novel, and sometimes there are things like info dumps or exposition. Although if you think you're getting a direct sort of side-by-side -side or a mirror for this being literally just like Wuthering Heights, I would say don't go in really expecting that, because I think the power of a true novel is really just within the reimagining itself, especially again thinking of the backdrop of post-war Japan, and even if these characters that Mizumura devises are highly inspired, I think in their own way they really do manage to set themselves apart over time, and I just think it's wonderful. I just love the whole world and idea behind these characters and how they were crafted, so I really love this novel. and. I hope more people pick it up. And the number one spot for my favorite read of 2021 is The Transition Baby by Tori Peters. I remember even when talking about this book in my April wrap up that I don't think I quite felt like I gave my full entire thoughts on it. In itself, I think because of that is why I love this book so much because it makes me turn over and over my thoughts and impressions on it, especially when I think about how this book is probably so different as a reading experience between so many different audiences as readers. If I could summarize this book, I would say simply put, it's a way in which three characters determine if they want to have a baby together. And all three of these characters, in a sense, have a definition, for the lack of a better term, on how they feel they exist in the world based on perhaps the external kind of perceiving them individually, which also, of course, creates these like intersections of thought between the three of them thinking of each other since they all already know each other in their own way with having their own origins of their relationships. And whether or not all three of them can really shape this idea of what it means to have a community, not only within what they're trying to do, but also again the big factor of the quiet external of how the world thinks of the three of them based on more identities and themes and things talked about that readers would discover whenever getting to know these very memorable characters. And I really think that's all thanks to Peters, too, because I think it's so intentional with the idea of the external also dipping into inclusiveness and the exclusive, where at times readers may not fully understand the jokes or references, not necessarily in a pop culture sense, but in a way where it's 
because of lived experience through the characters that we're reading about, but it just so happens to coincidentally be about, again, those aspects of community that I think they're looking for, that I think is tangible and real and important and within the real world too beyond fiction. And again, thinking of how Peters wrote this book and the way it's structured, I think it's really hard to pull that off with its execution. Of remaining mindful of a storytelling aspect of making sure the reader can follow along, but also then posing these really sort of confrontational aspects of how a reader can think of their own accountability with their own, like for me, my own personal experience with things I felt were familiar, but also something I was maybe unaware about. But yeah, like I said, I just really thought so much about this book. I really respect this book too, if that's maybe the right word that I'm thinking of. The Detransition Baby, I would say, is probably, out of all the books I mentioned today, the one I recommend the most whenever people ask me, you know, uh, people in my real life know I'm a reader, so uh, people will say, what should I read? And I always find myself gravitating toward Detransition Baby, which, of course, I think also, beyond my love of the book, uh, makes it deserve the top spot for my reading year that I had. But yeah, that does it for my top 10 reads of 2021. So this is my favorite like time of year, I guess, for BookTube, where I get to see a lot of videos like this. But if you, of course, don't do BookTube, um, if you have a favorite book that you've defined as your favorite of the year, please let me know what they are, because of course I'm crafting and thinking of what I'm going to read for 2022. As always, thanks for watching. I hope you have a great rest of the year, and I will see you next year.